good morning and welcome to my life I'm George and I have a very interesting person that we're going to be talking with today uh, Dr. John Robert Todd lives in Oxford but he's a professor at Rochester College and we're here in his office today and we're going to be talking about Dr. Todd's life and what he's experienced during his during his lifetime and I think we're going to find it very very interesting and and very enjoyable so first of all Dr. Todd it's a pleasure being with you today good to have you George and Ross great to be on Oxford TV thank you thank you uh, first of all tell me about basically where you grew up family siblings some interesting things about your start. Very good. Uh, I was born in 1946. I'm one of the early baby boomers. Mm -hmm. My mom and dad had both been in the Navy in World War II. My mom was a naval intelligence officer. My dad was began as a recruiter mm -hmm. and he recruited my mother and her <laughs> sister at Ohio State to be in the waves. Oh. And then he recruited her for a longer contract. Mm -hmm. And uh, then he went to pilot training, so that really inspired me later in life. Mm -hmm. And I grew up in Detroit till I was about 12. I had a Detroit newspaper route. Mm -hmm. Then we moved to Farmington and then to Walnut Lake in Bloomfield. Mm -hmm. And uh, my dad was a building contractor and occasionally to have a hundred skilled tradesmen working for him at union wages but then at other times he had one teenage boy me <laughs> so <clears throat> we had the feast and famine of the auto industry which affected the building industry in mm -hmm. Detroit mm -hmm. and uh, that I would say that in the formative years especially when I was a teenager 16 17 years old working for my dad was a, a very very interesting and uh, formative years for me, uh, learning the work ethic. Mm -hmm. um, and I did well at school. Uh, later I went to the University of Michigan. So I think from, from high school then graduating yeah. from high school you went on to U of M. And I also studied at Columbia University in New York. Okay. After the Army, I went to uh, okay, Georgetown so the, Law School. The Vietnam War was going on at that time. That I know when I was, was at Michigan State, yeah. it was at the time the Vietnam War was was revving up. Right. And so you were at U of M for a few years, then went in the service? Yes, I was drafted in 1967. Okay. And uh, I was all set to be a drafty infantryman. Mm -hmm. But I went down to a recruiter. I'd heard about the Army helicopter pilot training. Mm -hmm. And he said, great, great, I'll send you down to Fort Wayne. I took a test, took a Flight 1 physical test, and I qualified. I even met with a board of officers who decided that I was literate and I had no criminal record, so they approved <laughs> me for the officer flight training program. Mm -hmm. I took the slip back to the recruiter, and this was in 67 when they had manual typewriters. Okay. I was typing up my enlistment papers. And I said, Sergeant, does it matter if I would draft it? And I remember he just took his big hand, he went, <laughs> ripped the papers <laughs> out of the typewriter and threw them away, and he said, yep, it sure does, we don't have to give you nothing. So I went to about four months of infantry training and I always showed my commanding officers my qualification. And at the final day, the infantry company, we were out on the company street, the drill sergeant said, I've got good news and bad news. All of you have 30 days leave. The bad news is that you're all going to Vietnam as 11 Bravos, except and he called six names out of 200. And I was the last one, Todd. And he looked at me and said, you're gonna be a helicopter pilot. So then I went to flight school. I was okay. probably the only, one of the few or the only draftees in my flight school class. Mm -hmm. So that, from and after there, that, you, you I went to class to, and, then, and then over in, into Vietnam. Went to Vietnam, yes. 
And after about a year's training. After a year's training, and then I flew a gunship there. Okay. Which I'm very. In college, I had, as you mentioned, George, people talked about the draft. There was even the beginnings of some anti-war feelings. I mm -hmm. had a professor that also taught uh, Tom Hayden oh, in okay. political philosophy. Mm -hmm. And I had a different view than Tom did. Mm -hmm. uh, I believed that the war was right. I had grown up in the Cold War generation. Mm -hmm. The United States had made treaties with Vietnam. A treaty is a constitutional promise of our country. And it was a mutual defense treaty. We promised that we would defend South Vietnam if they were attacked or invaded by communist aggression. Mm -hmm. I believed in what I was doing. Mm -hmm. And as a gunship pilot, remember I'd had infantry training and my job as a gunship pilot was to protect those soldiers on the ground mm -hmm. whom I'd trained with. And I took that very seriously. We were able to accomplish our mission and also I think we saved a lot of American soldiers' lives. By providing that interference from yes, the air. By, and uh, so I felt very good about my Vietnam service. Mm -hmm. And in fact, when I came back in 69 as a wounded soldier, I was at Walter Reed for about a year. Mm -hmm. And then in 1970, the anti-war veterans began. And if you recall, they, they painted a picture of the American soldier in Vietnam as a drug-induced drug murderer. Mm -hmm. And I found that to be a great insult to mm -hmm. not only myself, but to my fellow soldiers. Mm -hmm. And I lived in New York. I began speaking out, and I was noticed by President Nixon. And I formed a group called the Vietnam Veterans for a Just Peace. I worked for him as a spokesman on Vietnam, defending his policies had a lot of great interesting experiences in that regard. Mm -hmm. And back to the to war then, and right now your your vision impaired, you're blind, and that was a result of, of yes, being I shot was, down then. <clears throat> I was... Uh, Were you shot down once or twice? Or twice. Twice. But the first time I was not injured. The okay. second time I was shooting at the enemy and they shot at me. The aircraft was hit 33 times. But miraculously, the aircraft still flew. The other pilot was able to pull us out of the dive. I was back with the doctor in six minutes. I was hit with a bullet through my cheekbone. Mm -hmm. And as a result, I'm blind. I went to uh, VA blind school. Mm -hmm. There's a good story about that later. Uh, I found that being blind was a great challenge, mm -hmm. but the interesting thing, George, is, and I also have a hearing problem because mm -hmm. of the injury, mm -hmm. the shock of the bullet. Mm -hmm. But I've come to realize, and I came to realize very early, that I'm alive, mm -hmm. I have my brain such as it is, mm -hmm. I had my manhood, I was able to marry a lovely lady, have two beautiful daughters, I've been married for 45 years. Uh, I've had a great career here at Rochester College mm -hmm. as a teacher. And uh, so I'm simply the luckiest and most blessed <laughs> man on earth. I, I should have been dead. I was at the bottom of a dive. Uh -huh. We never should have pulled out of the dive. The other pilot was brilliant. Mm -hmm. We were close to our base. He called ahead. The doctor was waiting on the flight line. Timing was perfect. Say again? I say timing was perfect. Timing maybe. was perfect and I survived. Okay. We're going to take a break now and come back for the next segment. We're now going to continue our discussion with Dr. Todd and his life 
we were just talking about the injury uh, as he was a pilot in Vietnam and the the recovery from that. You said that you went to the VA hospital uh, and you were there for a year. Well, I was a reconstructive and learning how to look how to function as a blind person. Yes, actually I was at Walter Reed Army Hospital for a year, had some plastic surgery, uh, and uh, but they found that they could not help my vision. Mm -hmm. So I was retired and went to the VA blind school in Hines, Illinois, near Chicago for one summer. Mm -hmm. And it was a very great program. After World War II, the VA with its World War II blinded vets actually developed what they called the long cane, revolutionizing blind mobility. And uh, so I was very, they had a wood shop there, which I enjoyed. They also had uh, a lot of group therapy, psychological testing, and I uh, had a lot of educational tests. I had one goal. I wanted the VA to pay for law school. I always wanted to be a lawyer growing up in the 50s watching Perry Mason. <laughs> and uh, So when I completed the program, I had an exit interview with the educational psychologist, Dr. Knudsen. And at the time, I was a 24-year-old single guy who'd been a gunship pilot. And uh, so I will admit, I wasn't I was a very conceited, arrogant fellow. <laughs> Walked into his office, he said, sit down, Mr. Todd. I said, no, let's sta I'll stand, it makes for shorter meetings. <laughs> and all I want to know, Dr. Knudsen, is will you pay for law school? And he said, yes, no problem. You you're, have a good IQ. Uh, then he said, so I turned on my heels, I said, thanks a lot, I'm out of here. He jumped up, he grabbed my arm, and he said, you've got to hear this. <laughs> and I said, all right, you've got a minute or two. And he said, based on all of your psychological inventories, you would be content as a pilot. I laughed, I said, I was. I uh, have a lot of decorations for valor. I was a very good pilot, I enjoyed it. And he said, and you would be happy as a lawyer. I said, good, pay for law school. Mm -hmm. But then he grabbed my arm again, and he said, but you should be a teacher. I said, doctor, <laughs> I've, I've done well at school, but it was a means to an end. Mm -hmm. I never thought of being a teacher. I liked some of my teachers. I disliked some of the rest. I never wanted to be a teacher. I think I'll be a lawyer. Thanks a lot. Just pay for law school. <laughs> Later, my wife and I did go to law school, which we'll cover in a minute. Mm -hmm. Okay, so, so with the, with now that, back to this. The, uh, after law school... For so how did you meet your wife, first of all? Let's, let's throw good. that in the mix. Well, when I worked for President Nixon, uh, if you will recall, in about 1972 and early 73, we had uh, a just peace or a peace with honor. In April, the, the peace accords were signed April 73, and remember our prisoners of war came home, mm -hmm. or some of them did. And uh, President Nixon and President Chu of Vietnam hosted a state dinner for the prisoners of war, about 30 of them and uh, I was invited. Mm. And uh, when I worked for President Nixon, I lived in New York because that's where my eye doctor was from. But I would come down to Washington and I would, also I would travel the country doing radio and TV. I did a lot of editorials for WCBS TV in New York. And uh, I had dated a girl in Washington, but she moved to Chicago to work for Phil Donahue. So in April of 73, I was invited to this White House state dinner, and I didn't know anyone in Washington. Called some old college friends. The, the fellow had been my roommate, and I had dated his wife. However, she got smart, dumped me, married him. <laughs> he went to law school and did not get drafted. 
but they lived in Washington. I called, was just going to take the wife as an escort. I needed a female. Mm -hmm. She said, well, my cousin just moved to town. She graduated from Pepperdine University in California. She's working at the CIA. I thought that would be good, so I had a blind date. Wow. And uh, within four months, we were married. Wow. And uh, Hit it off very well then. Right. And then I told her that I wanted to go to law school because I'd had this military and uh, hospital interruption. Mm -hmm. And she said that she had always wanted to be a lawyer, so I said, well, that's settled. Uh, I was accepted at Harvard, but she was not. Uh, she wanted me to go. And I told her, sweetie, I'm not going to law school without you. Mm -hmm. And so we went to Georgetown. Mm -hmm. One of the advantages of that, first of all, it was a great school. We had a great, a great education. Mm -hmm. But I also worked at Capitol Hill. I wrote and passed a bill through Congress which gave benefits to permanently and totally disabled veterans and their widows and orphans. So I felt very good about that. Mm -hmm. And that, uh, after we graduated law school, Joyce got a job, her name is Joyce, mm -hmm. with the Oakland County Prosecutors. Brooks Patterson hired her in mm -hmm. the 70s. She stayed there for about 30 years, convicted a lot of murderers, rapists. She headed up the first integrated child sex abuse unit. Uh, great lawyer. Mm -hmm. My wife practiced as a lawyer. I profess. Uh -huh. um, but I'm very proud of her. And she also worked for the Attorney General. She's won a couple cases, hundreds in the Court of Appeals and two in the Supreme Court. So, well, so I'm a very teaching. competent attorney. Uh, and she is as She's also a good mom, be. though, too, right? She was a very good mom. You had how many children? Two daughters. Two Both daughters. Both of them are married and doing well. In the area, or? Uh, my one daughter actually lives in Oxford, okay. Oxford Lake. She's a registered nurse. Her husband is a building contractor. Mm -hmm. I have one grandson who just graduated college, Chicago. My other daughter lives in Delaware. Okay. And she's in the... She went to the Fashion Institute of Technology in New York. She worked in public relations. Right now she's between jobs. Okay. And the picture, is it your granddaughter then that I see in the no, Coast Guard? Probably my wife. Oh. My daughter, daughter is had been in the Marine Corps. Oh, in the Marine Corps, okay. And uh, that's my older daughter got out and became a nurse. Okay. And then a lady in a gown, that's actually my wife. Yes, uh -huh. And uh, that was taken in about 2006 at our earlier daughter's wedding. So mm -hmm. my wife is, I've got three blondes in my family. Uh -huh. I, get, I get to tell blonde jokes. <laughs> However, I won't do that for Oxford TV. <laughs> okay, very yeah. good. We're at the end of our second segment, so we'll take a break and come back for the third segment in a moment. Great. Chester College with Dr. John Todd finishing up his My Life segment. And Dr. Todd, we've talked about your growing up, we've talked about your experience uh, with the military and your schooling and the, the effort with the, the veterans, the disabled veterans. Now let's talk a little bit about how you came into teaching. You, you have the law degree, but mm -hmm. that that person that you met said you had a, a passion for teaching, and I guess you found that. Yes, uh, I, I am a Christian. I truly believe in God's providence. Again, uh, I'm alive when I should have died. Mm -hmm. I should have crashed. I should have died from my wounds. But uh, miraculously, I was saved. Mm -hmm. And uh, then I met a lovely lady, I had some great political experiences, went to law school, and when we graduated, 
My wife was from Clawson, and I grew up here in Oakland County. And uh, she got a job at the Oakland County Prosecutor's Office. Mm -hmm. So I planned, we both came back to Michigan after we graduated from the Georgetown Law Center. We both passed the bar on the first time. She went to work as a full-time prosecutor. And I was going to be a lawyer. But I quickly found that there were a lot of talented lawyers in Rochester and Oakland County. It would be very competitive, and it's very difficult to get started. So I needed to do something, and I had an opportunity, just came up out of the blue, to teach at this college, which at that time was Michigan Christian College. Okay. And so I taught business law and politics. My original degree was in political science. That was at U of M. Studied at U of M and Columbia University in mm -hmm. New York. Mm -hmm. So I had a pretty good political science background, and I worked for a couple presidents, passed a bill through Congress, so I thought I could knew what I was talking about. Mm -hmm. But I quickly found that that educational psychologist at the blind school was right. I began to be extremely happy with my job. Mm -hmm. And uh, after a semester, I signed up again. And that was 40 years ago. Wow. And I am still here, and I plan on being here until they cart me away or <laughs> kick me out. I just love the students. I love the scholar life. Mm -hmm. One of my big pleasures is to give lectures. I've given a couple at the Oxford Public Library, which I love. Brian and his staff do a great job there. Mm -hmm. I will be speaking there again before the 4th of July on the Declaration of Independence. Mm -hmm. uh, and I speak at a lot of da uh, Daughters of the American Revolution, the Historical Society, mm -hmm. member of Judge Warren's Patriot Week Speaking Bureau. And uh, so I love being a teacher. In the 40 years, have you seen a change in, in the students? I or think pretty so. much the same. Well, um, tell, me, tell me the 40 years. What, all what? right. The, the thing about students is for an old guy like me. Uh, a grandpa. Our, I'm a grandfather of a college, of a recently college graduate. Uh -huh. So absolutely, the young people are inspiring. Uh, a lot of college students are very cool, mm -hmm. and so they don't participate in class. And you have to really draw them out. But when you do, you get some great students. I have one of my students uh, is the general counsel at Hillsdale College. Very proud of him. I have some other graduates. Mm -hmm. I have here on my desk a picture of a young lady graduated two years ago. She was the, one of the best students I've ever had. She came to me and said she wanted to join the military, which pleased me. I encourage and caution students about that. And since she was so bright, I told her she should become an officer. So I worked with her, with some friends from the uh, Air Force Association, and she's now a lieutenant in the Air Force in intelligence. Very proud of her. So those are the kind of things, kids that go on to law school, or Hannah, who's now a lieutenant in the Air Force. Mm -hmm. And then also, what I really enjoy is I just heard last week from two fine students from the 80s, young man, young woman, who met here. They're now married, they have a son. They invited me to speak at their son's school. Wonderful. And uh, so I was glad to hear from them, to hear that they are enjoying a good life together, mm -hmm. having met in one of my classes. Mm -hmm. And so I really enjoy hearing about the students who succeed, not only in uh, careers, but in their own personal life. Mm -hmm. It's the relationship that you establish. Yeah, absolutely. And you talked about the Oxford High School program. Oh. What what is that? Is it Oxford High School has a program called Early College, mm -hmm. and we are one of their partners. And they give 
they take the cream of the crop, the top students, mm -hmm. who are in their sophomore or junior year, can actually start taking college classes. And I've had several of them in my classes, and they're outstanding. Do they come here, or do you go there? They, we have some teachers who actually go to Oxford High School. Okay. I've never done that, even though I live about half a mile away. My mm -hmm. wife and I bought a house on Stony Lake. Mm -hmm. um, but these students, again, are 16, 17, 18 years old. They're not quite as cool as my college <laughs> students who are 18 to 20. Mm -hmm. And they speak up in class. They want to learn. They're terrific. They work hard. They're always there. They're always on time. They're always prepared. And I truly love them. Mm -hmm. And uh, so they, and literally, it is an amazing financial as well as educational deal for them. They can gain up to two years college credit. They can transfer to a four-year school as a junior, and the school district pays the freight of their first two years in college, wow. including books. It is a tremendous program, mm -hmm. and I really am proud to live in Oxford and, and uh, be a member of that community. Mm -hmm. It sounds sounds very exciting, and again, such a wonderful opportunity. And Absolutely, it gives you a chance to to be with the younger ones again yeah, and have so that extra enthusiasm. Ex exactly right, George. Exactly, very right. good. On your wall, you have a picture with President Obama. Can you describe that interaction? Yes. In 2013, I was given a national award from the Disabled American Veterans primarily based on the bill that I wrote and passed through Congress to aid widows and orphans of disabled vets. Mm -hmm. I was very proud of that. It, writing a bill in Congress, I just typed it up. I was a lobbyist, one of those evil lobbyists mm -hmm. who worked on the side of the angels here. Mm -hmm. it took me a year and a half because the House had a legal problem with it, so I found some good legal precedent, and I got the bill passed. So the DAV wanted to recognize that, mm -hmm. and right before the convention, which was in Orlando, the Secret Service called me and said that Mrs. Obama and President Obama would be at the ceremony. So I got on the stage at 8.30 in the morning, I had a coat and tie on, a uh, sort of suit coat on, hot lights coming down, uh -huh. and because I was blind, I was seated directly behind the podium my little part came about 9.30, I got the award, gave a short speech thanking the group. Mrs. Obama spoke at 12.30, the President spoke from 1 to 1.30, and I was seated directly behind him. Wow. All of the speakers were going out, uh -huh. and I had sunglasses on. Uh -huh. I fell asleep during the President's speech. <laughs> when the President finished, he turned around and there was a standing ovation. Uh -huh. But old Todd was just sitting there <laughs> snoozing. And uh, he came up to me and he put his hand forward to shake my hand and he Tapped woke you. me up. Mm -hmm. I just shook his hand. I don't know what I said to him, mm -hmm. but then other people took him away. So I didn't mean to disrespect him by going to sleep. <laughs> Yeah. But it was just my sleep apnea, and the <laughs> hot weather, and the hot lights, okay. and he took it uh, pretty well. Excellent. And the picture shows that graphically. Very well. So this has been a, a wonderful opportunity to sit down with you, and we have again heard a tremendous story of your life. It's been a pleasure today, Dr. Todd, and uh, we will uh, we'll wrap this up. Thank Absolutely, you. George. Thank, Thank you. you so much. Thank you.